You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. Welcome to The Open Door, a show based on the words in Revelation, I have left an open door before you, which no one can close. This is WCAT Radio's longest-running show, which opened the door to the radio station in October 2016. It's currently offered by Jim Hanink, Mario Ramos Reyes and Friends, and remains open to the love of God in its call to build a culture of life and a just social order through the panel's discussion of the Catholic social teaching principles of solidarity, subsidiarity, and economic democracy. The Open Door also explores nonviolence, distributism, and communitarianism. So join us at The Open Door, where you too can be part of the conversation. Welcome to The Open Door. Jim Hannick here with fellow panelists Mario Ramos Reyes and Christopher Zender. This week on The Open Door, we discuss fresh developments in the American Solidarity Party's 2020 presidential and vice presidential campaign. Two weeks left, how fares the Brian Carroll Amar Patel ticket? Our welcome and returning guest is California's Skylar Kovich, a long-serving member of the ASP National Committee. We begin in prayer. Come, O Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who has taught the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, Grant that by the gift of the same Spirit, we may be always truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through Christ our Lord. Amen. Skyler, you are a senior statesman at your tender age, a senior statesman, (laughs) so to speak, in a new and growing political party. Uh, when and yeah, how no, but, did you come to be a member of the American Solidarity Party? Uh, oh, that's a great question. I uh, found the party in 2016, the summer of 2016, uh, on the comment section of Rod Dreher's blog at the American Conservative. Uh, I was finishing up my doctorate in political science at the time, and and uh, actually writing my dissertation about how, about the, the problems of uh, socially conservative, economically progressive movements was uh, a large part of the topic. Uh, and so I, I've been interested in the possibility of finding something like this for a few years. I, I had uh, grown up as a Democrat, uh, become Catholic in college, and, and began to be more convicted about the, the uh, importance of the pro-life movement. Uh, so as I was finishing up, I realized that I wanted to be more involved in politics rather than just writing about politics. And when I found the party, I joined the Facebook group, uh, Desmond Silvera and a couple of others were, were very welcoming. And I really felt that I could contribute as part of the team. Uh, so I joined right when Mike Matterin was becoming the presidential uh, candidate. There was, uh, there was a, another uh, person who was the presidential candidate, Amir Azarban, but he had to drop out for uh, work-related reasons. And so his running mate took its place. And so the day I joined was, was uh, during that transition. Uh, and they needed someone to basically help Desmond out with ballot access research to figure out if we could get in any state ballot and uh, how we could get right in votes counted, uh, as well as some uh, media and policy and organizing work. And so I jumped into that. Uh, within a month or two, I was on the uh, National Committee because some people needed to leave the National Committee 
uh, because of the you know, extra amount of time it was taking. And so I, I got on that and uh, started to continue to build the party after the election. Uh, and we became a, a, a uh, uh, an official legal group. Uh, so in 2016, we got on the ballot in Colorado and uh, got right in votes counted in, in about 20 states, including California. So I had to kind of, you know, build the chapter from the ground up by uh, getting in touch with people who had signed up for the uh, uh, as party members, uh, which just meant being on the mailing list at the time. And one of those people that I contacted within that first month and got a response from was you'll never guess, Brian Carroll. And uh, I was very encouraged by his response. And I, I will say that I knew he would become uh, a really important member. Uh, so uh, to make a long story short, I uh, you know been elected to the National Committee twice since then, uh, uh, served as chair from 2018 to 2019, and then director of outreach and now chair again. Uh, I will say that I've definitely been on the National Committee longer than anyone else uh, on this committee and, and uh, I believe, in the party's history. There might have been one person who was on in the early days uh, for about this long, uh, before 2016. But, uh, you know, we've, you know, very proud of what we've been accomplished. And it's been, you know, quite a challenge at times. But, but I really enjoyed it. And uh, so at this point, I have uh, about six months left in my term, six or seven months after the election. Well, now that we know uh, or have had our memories refreshed about how Skyler got to be where he is, uh, Mario, could, could you ask uh, him a question about uh, where the party is? I guess Mario is stuck there, so oh, yeah. Christopher, why don't you I'm go so, ahead? I'm sorry. No, no, uh, I'm sorry. Oh, no, he's not stuck. He was just re reviewing the charts. That's what he was doing, reviewing the charts. Go yeah, ahead. I, was I was listening carefully about um, what uh, Skylar was saying, and uh, one thing caught my attention uh, before going into the question, which was, um, about that he, you, Skylar, belonged to the American Conservative um, um, magazine or movement. Uh, would you mind to elaborate a little bit about that? Because the reason why I'm asking that is because I was watching the other day TV, uh, cable TV, uh, and rarely I do that, and because of the election, I was just moving uh, back and forth, and, and I ran into an interview uh, of um, the Rod Dreher, the, the intellectual, the public intellectual, who wrote um, lately a book about um, not uh, living by lies or something of that sort, and he said that... Uh, Hey, he, in some ways, shared the ideals of the American Solidarity Party, and I know that he's one of the right. He's one of the editors of American Conservative. Uh, oh yeah, thanks for reminding me. Right. Would you like to comment on that? Yes. So uh, I first found Rod Dreher's blog at about you know maybe 2012 or so, and. Uh, so he, uh, in addition to being the editor of the American Conservative, he writes, I think, two or three articles a day, probably. Uh, right. And his blog uh, has a uh, very active commenting community. And so I, I, I got interested in Roger Ayer's blog because I had, you know, been becoming more involved in the more uh, conservative Catholic community. Uh, at my parish, and you know, he you know provided an onla online place to learn more about uh, uh, you know more, I guess, traditional or orthodox, a smaller orthodox Christian thought. Uh, and I uh, 
got interested in his Benedict option concept, and uh, that book came out in uh, 2017 after I, I had found the party. But it was one of his commenters, and fortunately I don't know who it was, who mentioned the American Solidarity Party in one of his comments section about the 2016 election. Uh, and that is how he found out about it the first time and immediately got involved. Uh, in 2016, Dreher mentioned that he was interested in the party, but uh, would really only promote it if it got in the ballot in his home state of Louisiana, uh, which I think he was not expecting. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't make it in 2016, even though Louisiana is uh, one of the easiest states to get on the ballot. It was, it was just a bit late, and we were missing someone from one of the congressional districts. Uh, within those years, uh, a few of Rod Dreher's friends and correspondents were involved in the party, and uh, so he was definitely kept updated on it. Uh, and he kind of let on on the blog a few times that, that he, he was aware of it. Uh, but you know, I, I had never really talked to him personally. Uh, then last week, uh, the way he tells it, he just happened to find the party on his Louisiana ballot because we'd gotten ballot access there. And he kind of on the, in the spur of the moment uh, wrote a Twitter endorsement of us and then an article a couple of days later. Uh, by this point, uh, a, a few months ago, Leah Labresco, who wrote a sequel of sorts to the Benedict Option book for Catholics called Building the Benedict Option, had uh, become involved in the party and is now on our board of advisors. Uh, so I will say I, I wrote to Rod to uh, thank him for the endorsement, and, uh, and, and he responded back. Uh, obviously, not everyone agrees with uh, Rod Dreher's thoughts on everything. I mean, it, it would be fair to say he's more toward the right end of the party uh, on, you know, almost everything except perhaps the uh, uh, COVID response. Uh, but I do think that he, uh, he has a lot of important thoughts to share. And, uh, you know, I, I agree with his, uh, you know, a lot of his ideas on, on uh, the importance of religious liberty. And, uh, you know, the problems with cancel culture, uh, that sort of thing. And, uh, and, and the need for, uh, Christian families to build community. So, uh, yeah, it, it is a big development that he, he has, uh, you know, plugged the party. And, and yes, the, uh, a morning Joe show on MSNBC, it, it's really amazing that you just happened to catch that, Mario, because he, he, he did, uh, mention that there too. Christopher, and you're up. Oh, I'm up. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Curious about the comparing the ASP, ASP's presence on the ballot in 2016, 2020. Now, and in particular, maybe uh, this is just an observation I've had. In 2016, there were a lot of even people who call themselves conservatives who did not like Donald Trump, and I think that attracted a lot of it attracted some people to the party, at least probably a good number. Uh, this time around, a lot of the people who said they didn't like Donald Trump in 2016 have now gone over to Donald Trump because this is one of those, we're, we're in another, um, of course, election cycle where there's a, where it's, there's deemed to be an existential threat to everything good uh, that, that, that hangs on it. How do you think that that's, what do you think that on the whole are the differences between um, like the like the chances of the party now as opposed to 2016, and especially in particular in terms of the kind of the, the increased polarization and the sense of panic that seems to fall on both sides of the political spectrum. Right, yeah, we definitely lost some people, uh, both uh, never, former Never Trump Republicans who have now gone over to Trump, or uh, you know, even people have moved a bit more to the right who were, had not been Republicans before, but have been ra radicalized by various things going on. And uh, pro-life Democrats and former Never Trump Republicans or uh, Biden supporters are, are uh, 
McMullen supporters. Yeah, yeah. Uh, pro-life Democrats and never Trumpers who had supported McMullen, who are now Democrats. Uh, uh, John Kasich, probably being the, the most prominent example of this, who are supporting Biden. Uh, some of that, that for, for a few of those people, it's because they don't they, they they had a personal conflict with the party. But for most of them, it really is a fear of uh, Donald Trump and a uh, a feeling that that Biden is uh, going to be relatively centrist on the uh, abortion issue. And uh, despite that, though, we do have a lot of new people who weren't around in 2016. Uh, some of them might have had a shift in their politics and what they're ready for, you know, realizing that, that both the Democrats and Republicans are, you know, don't have a lot to offer. And some of them might have just not heard about the party in 2016. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, the fact that we've, we've gone from one state to eight states, uh, obviously we've in some ways gained a couple of states and lost a couple of states uh, because of COVID. But uh, eight Eight states was around what we were projecting actually as a as a campaign goal. Some of the states just happen to be different ones, uh, and we've done better with our uh, right in counting as well. And uh, then in the last month of the election, uh, we've gotten more interest through Twitter and Facebook uh, than we had in 2016. So yeah, I do expect us to get far more votes. Uh, in 2016, uh, or then in 2016, uh, not having a McMullen type candidate probably does bring some people in. Uh, and we do face a little bit of competition from uh, Kanye West, perhaps in some states. But actually, a lot of the, some of the states where we're on the ballot don't overlap with the similar number of states where he's on the ballot. Uh, so it will be very interesting to see. Uh, how that shapes up. We've spoken already about uh, increased polarization and we've all felt its effects. And Christopher mentioned existential threats and, and the like. Uh, there's an old saying, I guess you could trace it back to Joe Hill don't mourn for America, organize. And I wonder if you could uh, lay out for us some of the specific nuts and bolts organizational efforts the party has, has made in the last year or so. Right. So uh, we are very interested in uh, ballot access for Kara Patel because we know that it, it brings attention to the party, and it has. Uh, so uh, we've attempted some uh, volunteer petition drives. Uh, for those who might not know, uh, ballot access uh, is very different in each state for getting a presidential candidate on the ballot. You require anything from, in Colorado, just nine individuals to sign as electors and a $1,000 filing fee. Uh, all the way to uh, California, uh, needing hundreds of thousands of signatures unless you're already a qualified political party. Uh, so we had the goal of getting on the ballot in as many states as possible that required uh, something like 2,000 signatures or less. And we tried to get volunteers to do some of the petition drives. And we were able to do a bit of that but we needed uh, paid petitioners to go out and do a lot of the circulation, uh, perhaps especially after COVID. For a couple of months, those paid petitioners were not really uh, able to do anything. But by May, uh, by May or June, they were actually starting up again. Uh, so as a national committee, uh, we, we uh, targeted states to... Uh, get the party on the ballot. And uh, then after COVID, when, when we, uh, most, you know, 
wondered if we'd be able to do much more at all and maybe just get two or three states. Then there was another round in the summer of uh, you know, doing more petition drives. Unfortunately, a couple of them failed uh, because of uh, technicalities that were unclear at the time. Uh, so, so that was a big disappointment. But in Illinois, we actually did do an all-volunteer drive because uh, they lowered the requirement to something like 300 signatures from 25,000. And oh, oh, Amar Patel, cool. uh, yes. Yes, that, that was really something. And so Amar Patel uh, just happened to be our vice presidential candidate and was able to organize that Illinois drive. I think they were able to have electronic signatures, which helped too. But so that one was actually all volunteer. And uh, of course, Illinois is a large state with uh, Dan Lipinski had lost the primary. So there's lots of uh, pro-life Democrats, perhaps especially older voters who are not perhaps as involved in the online Christian intellectual circles, but are now uh, investigating the party. Uh, same with Wisconsin, actually, where we, we got on the ballot. Uh, you know, maybe older uh, Christian voters who are either pro-life Democrats or moderate Republicans. And they, they uh, you know, we've gotten several phone calls, actually, to the party phone number from people who've, uh, who've liked what they've seen through that. Uh, then there's also the uh, organizing for write-in votes to be counted, which again, is very different from e each state, but uh, much easier than ballot access. And so we've been involved in organizing the efforts in those states to get the paperwork filled out. Uh, in California is one of the more difficult ones. You need to get 55 electors uh, and we've gotten most of the states, uh, you, know, you know, probably about three quarters of the states which have a uh, write-in registration form of some kind. Uh, so that's been a big part of the organization. Uh, also following up with media requests and uh, submitting media requests of our own, uh, publicizing the media requests we do get on social media, and also honestly, talking to random people on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, it's been a big part of what I'm doing. Uh, we have a new uh, board of advisors, which includes uh, uh, Charlie Camosi and another board member of the Pro-Life Democrats in the past, Lo Lois Kirchen, uh, Leah Labresco, a, a Catholic author I mentioned, and uh, uh, John Madai, who I think might have been in the show before, and uh, 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 Chuck Maron of Strong Towns, which is a uh, important community development organization. We're very fortunate to get him on the board, uh, and and a couple of others. And you know, we've we've gotten a lot of interest in the party as those people have uh, shared the party, especially on Twitter. And uh, I haven't been involved in this one part, but there's also been a lawn sign uh, drive as well to get to get lawn signs to people. Well, listen here. We had uh, right here in the, the great city of Inglewood, California, Brian Carroll delivered six signs. That was very, very nice. Uh, uh, yeah, that's great. All, all of this, Skyler, and maybe you could fill in some of the, the details. All of this is a every single day effort it's it's Definitely. something that really requires a whole bunch of volunteers to do a whole bunch of things every single day definitely yeah yeah we uh so we have our uh, national committee which is uh nine people and uh obviously i mean a few of us need Days, you know, days off. You know, but most of us need days off at some point. So it's not, you know, but I have at least managed to do a little bit every day. Uh, Brian and Amar. Uh, Amar was on the national committee at the beginning of the campaign, but it's not now. Uh, so of course they have to uh, follow up with things every day. Uh, and then we have a few uh, state leaders. Actually. Yeah, I guess the majority of states have some sort of 
a coordinator right now, and then a few have really well organized committees, and uh, and then a few people who are just unofficially, you know, maybe not as much of a state leader, but who are uh, very much involved in the in the national effort. All right, uh, Mario. Yes. What should we turn to next? Well, uh, just a follow-up question. You mentioned at one point Twitter. Um, which uh, medium do you think is more efficient to reach to young people, particularly millennial? It's just uh, the old style of uh, walking around and meeting people and or just um, using uh, Twitter and Facebook. What is the best uh, way to read these people, do you think, Skylar? I think uh, Twitter is more likely to reach people who are more likely to be interested because it, it can be done a bit more strategically. Uh, obviously, people who are good at walking around and talking to random people uh, should do that. And uh, obviously, in-person activities, perhaps through churches or uh, community organizations, are very important. But it can be very hard to you know, sustain someone's interest in the conversation. And obviously, a lot of people that you would meet uh, going out in the community just simply don't agree with us. Uh, but I think there are some people who are very good at that kind of engagement, and, and it should be done. Uh, we should also investigate more some of the social media platforms that younger people are on. Uh, uh, you know, we, we don't have a strong presence on Instagram, so that we, well, we need to work on that. Uh, but there is, of course, a big gap between people who are already involved in the online Christian intellectual circle. Uh, and I think that that is, you know, the, the uh, core constituency of our party. But we obviously need more than that. And so we're, we're going to have a challenge in the next couple of years to see if we can figure out how to do more of that. And I think there's been some progress this year, especially on the states where we're on the ballot. Uh, and, yeah, I'll be interested to see what good ideas people have. Right. So, so um, before going into the post-election season, what to do next uh, uh, after the election, um, do you have any estimate or some guess about how many votes do you think uh, our ticket is going to get on September, on this, on November the third? Right. So. Uh most of the states that have write-in votes don't count them until later in November or even December, I think, in California's case. So we won't know right on election night. Uh, so on election night last year, we only got the count from Colorado we were, where we were on the ballot and some write-in votes from Texas. Uh, and then by the time we got the counts from all of the states who would count our votes, it was about 6,700. Uh, this year, now I know that, you know, many states we're not going to get a complete count, but we will get some votes counted in election night in probably eight states, plus, plus where we're on the ballot, plus, again, Texas, which uh, has a more efficient way of counting some of the write-in votes. Uh, and so I, I would hope that we would surpass that 6,700 total actually on election night. Uh, I think we have a good chance at uh, at least 20,000 votes uh, before everything is done. I think, like I said, even though we've lost a few people, we've gained so much more publicity and more interest from people who might not have known about us in 2016. Uh, you know, we, we should get at least 20,000. I think a good goal would be 50,000. And I think we do have a chance at uh, 100,000. Whoa, that would be terrific. That's yeah, and we, and we could even uh, pass up the uh, Constitution Party as the uh, 
third largest third party. Whoa, that See, they're not be... doing so well this year. Christopher, can can you imagine how many votes would be coming from your neck of the woods? No idea. I mean, we were right in the state. I, where I live, it's heavily the part of Ohio I live in, which is probably most of Ohio geographically, is Trump country. So you see a few Biden signs around, but you see mostly Trump and multiple Trump signs. And uh, that's the question I, I sort of returned to what I said earlier. I put up on my Facebook fa feed um, uh, a reminder to Ohioans what they have to do to vote for the, the American Solidarity Party. So I did it on uh, a okay. local, like on our township site, and I've done it. I done it. I was on mine, and the response I, I keep getting is mostly and these are people from what you quote unquote right is um, not this year, not this year because it's too much is at stake. And I know the same thing. You, you, you hear you'll hear from people who might otherwise agree with the party, but yet have a more left leaning yeah. orientation. It's it, it's a neck, it, this this is too important. Election. Of course, we hear this every four years. Um, how does how do you uh, how does the party counter that? I mean, because it, it seems like a cogent argument. I, I would think this is a too important election to cast aside. Right. Every right. Year. Yeah, right. and it all it all depends on. I mean, obviously, if you truly believe that either Trump or Biden is going to cause that significant of damage, uh, then I guess. You know, it's one of the great tragedies of politics. The people who might agree on policy just have such huge strategic differences. Uh, so yeah, we in in uh, states which are not swing states, uh, you can just say that uh, well, the more our vote total runs up, uh, the more our method will be spread. And people, the major parties will realize uh, that they're missing out on a huge group of people. And there's little risk to, to uh, hurting your lesser, lesser evil candidate in a swing state. Uh, uh, sorry, in a safe state. Uh, now, some people will then respond, well, we actually need our lesser evil candidate to run up as huge numbers as possible in order to increase his uh, legitimacy. Uh, but, you know, we can still say I mean, to people who really are possibly having some interest that, you know, in, in a swing state, uh, sorry, in a safe state, uh, there's not much risk and, and it will, you know, be much more powerful to spread the message of the third party. In a swing state, uh, like Ohio or Michigan, especially one where we're uh, right in, and, and I think, uh, Wisconsin and Colorado are the uh, swing states where we're on the ballot. And Wisconsin is especially important because there's really only a few candidates, a third party candidates on the ballot. Uh, that is definitely more of a challenge. But we can say that we have an even bigger impact if we do actually uh, risk affecting the outcome in a swing state. Uh, so as far as Ohio, I, I think in states like Ohio and Michigan, like similarly sized right in states. We got about 500 votes counted in 2016. So I, I do think we'll surpass that. A couple of days ago, uh, a party member in Ohio, right? Uh, Zeb Buccelli? No, he's in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania? Okay. Uh, he had a, a post in, in which he said that there's a kind of idolatry of the president, whoever it is, and that so much is invested into uh, deciding who's going to be the president and what the president will do, that uh, there's a, a kind of distortion of the, the larger political order. And in terms of this idolatry of the president uh, for years people have been talking about the imperial presidency but in terms of this idolatry of, of the, the president the, the significance of some one vote 
uh, has taken on uh, uh, a, a wildly inflated uh, role that, in fact, no one vote makes any difference anyway, and that people treat their vote as if they were deciding whether to worship this God or that God. Uh, what, what do you make of that? Well, I mean, I think it, that mentality was meant for good at first in order to uh, get people to take voting seriously and to, you know, turn out to vote and take the civic responsibility seriously. Uh, for uh, Catholics and, and uh, members of some other denominations, it's obviously got out, out of hand the way that uh, uh, some people want the Catholic Church to take a position in favor of uh, the Republicans, or, or uh, I mean, there, you'll see occasional people that want the Catholic Church to, to uh, support the Democrats. And in some ways, uh, the you know, there are opportunities for the ASP here because, uh, you know, if people who vote for a third party, they're actually very likely to, to take their vote seriously. And, uh, you know, Catholic priests and bishops can actually, you know, do a little bit to promote the, the solidarity party if, you know, if, if they wish and you know, as, as an alternative option. But, uh, yeah, there's definitely a lot of concerns about the, you know, oversaturation of the presidential election. And we play into it a bit because of the fact that uh, we place so much emphasis on our presidential campaign. And uh, so we get so many questions about why we don't start out locally. Uh, but it is hard to recruit local candidates. And actually, the local elections for city council and such are not really where the big problems with the two-party system are. Mario, there's just been a, a, an election, uh, it's part of a phase, but an election of great significance in Bolivia. And uh, just last week we had the arrest of, happened in Los Angeles at our airport, of General Cienfuego, uh, who turns out to be uh, a player in the cartel in Mexico. And, and all of this is something that uh, Obrador has to comment on. And I can imagine people in Mexico saying, what difference does it make what party's in position? Uh, could you say a little bit, tell us a little bit about your sense of of how Latin Americans respond to uh, big elections. Well, um, it's a very interesting question. Uh, the case of Bolivia, uh, which held elections last uh, Sunday, at least the first stage, then they will have the second stage with all the winners or the two winners uh, uh, of the most voted on Sunday. And the surprise victory of the party or the movement of the former president who was deposed because of corruption and fraud is, uh, is very compelling in many ways, which means that to uh, most of the electorate, are accustomed, I'm going to use this word, or were somehow raised in believing that the president or the state will solve all their issues. So if you are running on a platform where you are proposing that if the electorate choose you, then you are going to solve all their anxieties, and then people are going to elect you. So there is a, a very widespread uh, aware uh, conscience of uh, populism in Latin America, and Bolivia is one of them. So that is why it's very difficult to move to a different way of electing president when the president, what we said before, is not that important. 
rather it's important the community you start building the sense of uh, uh, working with your neighbors and then you form a different type of democracy more communita communitarian rather than individualist or um, pure sta statism or everything comes from the government so that's I think that we are right now in Latin America to what extent really country have this strength to build a middle ground um, and that is what happened in Bolivia. Now, we don't know what is going to happen next election in Bolivia when the two most voted parties uh, uh, run again. So, but at the same time, there is a widespread uh, feeling of corruption. So, and the case in uh, the Mexico is one of the, uh, to what extent really corruption, drug trafficking influence on elections. That is um, um, an open question in, in, in some countries, really, there are cartels running, and probably the, the rumor is that they also have some Congress people um, who are somehow defending their own interests. So, again, if we look at the history of Christian democracy and you read carefully <laughs> the books uh, of uh, Eduardo Frey in, in Chile, for instance, and look at what happened in Chile right now and in the other part of Latin America. Well, precisely that was the warning of uh, Eduardo Frey. If you don't build communities, in these communities don't build out of families, and you don't have certain notion of what uh, morality is, and so any constitutional change, any election will be almost useless. So unless you go back to what we may call the basics. And I think that in that sense, the proposal of the American Solidarity Party or parties like the American Solidarity Party, I think is the solution not easy to reach, but will last. One thing that comes to mind in, in listening to your uh, comments is that the more and more there's this uh, strongman uh, vision, the more and more we look to somebody who will set things straight, uh, the more and more the, we, we uh, undermine any kind of across-the-board political development. And that's a huge violation of the principle of subsidiarity. Yes. Uh, if so-and-so is truly going to set everything straight, then all our efforts ought to be directed to the election of so-and-so, and, well, everything else is kind of left to stagnate. I, yes, I think you're right. And so the, even the language, when you hear the language used by the people, in these uh, different policies, and that is you can apply to any country in South America, the quarantine, which was established of different length, uh, depending on the country, but the uh, people said, well, the government is taking care of us. The government is healing us. Always there is a sense of paternalism, even among the people. And so that means that the culture somehow have changed toward giving your own freedom, if you will, or your own care to the state. And that, um, I think, shows that the task is, if we can use this term, pre-political. It's more cultural and going back to the communities. And that, I think, is the the pastoral of the church, or the Catholic church, or the evangelical churches. Otherwise, uh, I think it's going to be very hard to change this mentality. Yeah, and that seems right to me. And and sometimes the, the strong man, the charismatic strong man, is played off against the... <clears throat> Technocrat. <laughs> so and so is a non-charismatic but very savvy 
technocrat. But but that's not what we're looking for either. It's not like uh, technology or that uh, kind of focus is going to save us any more than the, the charisms of the leader uh, are going to save us. What we need is a, a, a real development of well, civic friendship and engagement with the, the political uh, uh, on a broad range of fronts. All right, Christopher, you're the educator. You write textbooks. What are we going to do about this? How are we going to change this? <laughs> yeah, textbook writers change the world. Well, um, oh, listen, yeah. one thing that comes to pass whenever a new regime comes into play is that there are new textbooks. And uh, good grief, in the United States there's been an ongoing struggle over what textbooks are we going to have. So uh, a lot of people think that they make a huge difference. Yeah, well, they, they do. I, I, um, I, the, I, I, the whole question is interesting because... I, from the perspective of myself, who have been more or less involved in local politics for a long time, in, both in California and now in my tiny little village in, in Ohio, uh, you know, it's it's uh, there's a there's a kind of lethargy and laziness I, I notice. I mean, you, we have a village of 400 people, which could actually have a lot of effect on what they decide on, on life of the people. But I I started to go to the, the village council meetings and. And I was, we had a last one. It was one particular issue where maybe three people, including myself, who were not council members, showed up, and they, uh, and they were. Just, they said, "This is the first time anybody's come to the council meeting in, in years." You know, three hundred percent increase. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> it might not have been years, but at least months and many months. Um, and there's a kind of lethargy, a sense that. Uh, I, the only time we, we even think about civic duties is when election time. Now, I think part of that is is that so many people are struggling to make it. You know, they have um, sometimes hu husbands and wives both work. Uh, people are actually engaged in their everyday lives, and the and they just feel like they don't have time in some cases to actually dedicate to this sort of thing. And uh, in other cases, just there's this the, the, the entertainment culture that we have here in the United States that just uh, assumes people into itself. Um, you know, it, it's, it's kind of the funny thing about this village council meeting is that because I've been gone, I've gone two times, they now ask me to fill in one of the vacancies. <laughs> So <laughs> it's like you come to a village meeting <laughs> twice, and you, you now we want. Have you ever thought of serving? <laughs> so, uh, will, will you do it? I yeah, I, I told him I would, but I have to have lived here a year, and that's just happened. Huh. So we don't have any carpet baggers. <laughs> yes. so, so let, let us know when you take office, and we can send you on our website. That's one of the we, we've gotten to. Uh, city council members in Pennsylvania, actually a mayor in Pennsylvania as well, to uh, be publicly identified with the party. Yeah. You know, uh, along these lines, uh, you you forever hear politicians saying it's it's constant. It's the only thing that comes up more than the name Donald Trump. You for ever hear them saying, the American people this, the American people that, this is not who we are, the American people. But what you never hear anybody say is what Christopher just said. A lot of problems in this country, and one of them is that the American people are so damned apathetic. <laughs> <laughs> You can never hear any politician say that. And now, just a little anecdote, because I want to get back to Skyler. Uh, a little anecdote. Uh, my brother, who's very infirm, uh, had a doctor's appointment yesterday, and I took him to the doctor. And, and we also got the day before a jury summons, a jury summons uh, for my brother. And so I asked the doctor if he would sign off saying that, oh, this is not going to work out. 
At which point the doctor says, I don't know why they don't get different people to, to do this jury thing. I mean, I myself had to spend a whole day down there, and uh, people have got other things to do. And, and so I said in, a, in a, 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 a kind of tone, maybe snarky. Some might call it snarky, <laughs> but I wouldn't. Uh, I would call it educational. Do you know, doctor, that in Aristotle's politics, written around 250 B.C., there's a back-and-forth discussion at some length about how to get people to do their jury duty. <laughs> it's it's oh, yeah. uncanny it's of some of these problems that are truly political problems having to do with the civic order are so endemic. It's just amazing. All right, well, here, enough of that. Now, Skyler, you began by talking about your scholarship, and then you talked about how you were led into activism, and for your active service, we thank you. But uh, could you tell us, uh, just looking ahead, uh, to some day or other, a day that's never come for me, uh, about the book you'd like to write, or in the interim, while we're waiting for you to write your book about the book that you would like us to read. Ah, that's a uh, good question. So the uh, uh, I, I've been doing a bit of writing. Uh, during this time, uh, not, not as much as I should be, but uh, I've written a couple of journal articles, including a uh, co-authored one about uh, the politics of assisted suicide. And uh, the co-authored one is with Jacqueline Abernathy, another uh, a party member, yes. who has a doctorate in political science as well. Uh, I have an offer from a friend to uh, co-author a book about the politics of uh, blindness in America, uh, for those who don't know, I'm totally blind, and there are several competing organizations of the blind in the U.S., uh, so looking into the internal politics of those. Uh, I'm also considering the idea of writing more of a weekly column on uh, politicians who, you know, you know, historically in the U.S. or throughout the world, or, or even contemporarily, who might have something to teach us, uh, both for the good or, or the bad or the mix about uh, about uh, AFP, or, or about you know Christian democracy, distributism, consist uh, whole life. Uh, anything with the best, uh, one of the best uh, nonfiction books that uh, kind of along those lines that uh, would be interesting to, you know, to have everybody read. Uh, well, let's see. With them beeping there. Uh, would probably be, and, and it, it can be really hard with politics because uh, so many books which seem really important at the time become a bit outdated very quickly. So, like, for example... Uh, American Grace by Robert Putnam and David Campbell, which Robert Putnam had written Bowling Alone, which predicted a lot of the decline of social capital and the civic institutions. Uh, so that was 2000, American Grace was 2010. And so a lot of the theory is still there, but the numbers are uh, a bit off now, you know, when you talk about religious observance and things like that. So they got the trends accurately. Uh, but you know, it would be interesting to read uh, some of their newer books about uh, religion and politics, uh, which, which, which was always uh, one of my fields. And, uh, Could you give us yeah. those names again? Uh, Robert Putnam and David Campbell wrote the book American Grace, and I think Putnam has, writ has written a few books which might be less about religion but are more, uh, you know, up to date, it might include a little bit about religion. Uh, one book I read uh, recently is American Carnage by Tim Alberta, who's a political journalist, actually, about the Republican Party in the 2010s. 
All right. And I know Mario wants us to reread Eduardo Frey, right? Well, uh, yeah, that does, I'd like to read a biography of him. And, of course, Pope Francis' encyclical for Tele Tutti, I, uh, I need to get around to reading. You've read it? And I, I have not yet, except for some excerpts. But uh-huh. I will. Well, Hopefully I can do that say I read week. it. It's long, and there's right. an awful lot there that corresponds with the American Solidarity Party. Awful lot. Yes. But I, I think one book which I'm reading or rereading lately, particularly uh, to follow the this uh, presidential election and to remind me about building community is... Alexis de Tocqueville, Democracy in America. And I think yeah, that book must be read by everyone in the American Solidarity Party. And it's very, very compelling. Uh, some people may say it's very nostalgic, but something that is doable to build from the bottom up to create the relationship between Christianity and democracy, education, subsidiarity, solidarity. And I think coming from a Catholic in the 19th century, which are visiting America, and what he's saying there about religion is very, very compelling without really preaching, without moralism, but it's very interesting. And I, I, at least in my this context, I think, I perhaps my views were enriched more than when I read before many years ago. Christopher, a, a, a book plug before we close? Well, I've been reading a, a biography, a rather long biography of Orestes Bronson. Uh, those of you who don't know he is, he was a early 19th century Catholic, um, actually a convert, a, originally um, a champion of, of labor in um, the 1820s, 30s, and 40s, and he, and a convert. Um, he has some interesting takes on the whole American system. It's a long biography. I don't know if you can still find it. It was published by Our Sunday Visitor by a, a, a Father Ryan, CSSP. And it's it's a very interesting book. I think Bronson is oh, yeah. That's a, a lot interesting. Of I was looking into reading a biography of Newman as well, actually, for it. Same time. Yeah, I don't always agree with Bronson, but I think a lot of things Bronson says are come very close. At least I'm I'm in the part where he's in the in the earlier part of his career before he was a Catholic. But it's interesting to what degree he actually came around to a, a, a more classical or Catholic view of the nature of the political order. Uh, all on his own, the man was completely self-educated and, and brilliant, and. Um, at the time, he could have actually taught in a university, even though he had never gone to a university himself. So, it you a sense he was very prominent in the transcendentalist movement, though he never himself was fully a transcendentalist. Uh, he's always a, he was always a bit, he was always sui generis. In his if he uh, were to go to Notre Dame, Indiana, sometimes confused with South Bend, if he were to go to Notre Dame, Indiana, uh, and go into the church there on campus and uh, and then decide that you wanted to, to look around a bit, you might go down to the chapel in the basement. Uh, and if you were to go down to the chapel in the basement and you were to walk up the main aisle every once in a while looking down, you would at one point be walking over the duly labeled grave of Orestes Brownson. Right. Uh, made the oh, so it took me by surprise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I was there. Very, there. Same here, yes. Watch, watch your step there. Watch your step. Uh, that's very interesting. Well, speaking of that, we actually just uh, started a chapter at Notre Dame for Solidarity uh-huh. Party. Excellent. Well, then, on that upbeat note, we turn to... Uh, the Gospel for Today, taken from Luke. Jesus said to his disciples, Be sure of this, if the master of the house had known the hour when the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. 
You also must be prepared, for at an hour you do not expect, the Son of Man will come. Then Peter said, Lord, is this parable meant for us or for everyone? And the Lord replied, Who then is the faithful and prudent steward whom the master will put in charge of his servants to distribute the food allowance at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom his master on arrival finds doing so. Truly I say to you, he will put him in charge of all his property. But if that servant says to himself, My master is delayed in coming, and begins to beat the men servants and the maid servants to eat and drink and get drunk, then that servant's master will come on an unexpected day at an unknown hour and will punish the servant severely and assign him a place with the unfaithful. That servant who knew his master's will but did not make preparations nor act in accord with his will shall be beaten severely, and the servant who was ignorant of his master's will but acted in a way deserving of a severe beating shall be beaten only lightly. Much will be required of the person entrusted with much, and still more will be demanded of the person entrusted with more. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Hello, God's Beloved. I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. Thank you for listening to a production of WCAT Radio. Please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up where knowledge takes flight.